Peter Reinhardt sold his tech company segment for $3.2 billion to Twilio. He now runs Charm Industrial, focused on carbon removal. Peter, welcome to Kitco. Thanks for having me. Peter, I'm going to let you play to Kitco's crowd here. Molecules seem to be more sexy than bites these days. Why did you decide to get your hands dirty? Yeah, I, I actually was an aerospace engineer originally. I studied aerospace engineering at MIT and kind of fell backwards into starting a software company with my roommates. Um, so I've always wanted to get back to sort of getting my hands dirty, but I think it's also pretty clear that at this point, I, you know, the climate problem is going to demand that we go rebuild many, many trillions of dollars worth of infrastructure. And so there's just a huge opportunity, I think, to go and improve the world and, and the world of atoms and um, that's a that's an exciting opportunity to go try to wrangle. Now, with your uh, last uh, business uh, segment, um, you were buying uh, carbon offsets, uh, but uh, you kind of ran into a problem when you were buying those carbon offsets. Yeah, that's right. When we were about maybe fifty or hundred people in two thousand fifteen. I decided that we should go purchase some some offsets to kind of offset our emissions as a software company, which were fairly minimal, like data center and you know food for lunch and stuff like that. And we went and we bought some offsets that were uh, available for protecting Amazonian rainforest and uh, Indonesian rainforest. And so we did that. And you know, a year later, in kind of spring of 2016, it was Earth Day again. It was like, you know, what happened when we when we went and purchased these offsets? And the deeper that we dug into it, the more disappointed I, I got. Like. One, it was super opaque as to what actually happened when we spent that money. Um, and two, as I dug into it, I realized maybe 70% of it went to like companies in the US and only 30% of it was actually going through to actually protect any rainforest. And then when you protect that rainforest, how do you know it's not gonna go up in flames in a forest fire? Uh, this has now become a real problem in a lot of the California forests that were selling offsets. How do you know that you're not just blocking this particular acreage from getting cut down and that just the acreage next door is getting cut down instead? Um, it's that question of additionality uh, and leakage. Uh, and then, you know, you need to set us to offset permanent emissions. You need to go set aside forest for a thousand years. And so, you know, how do you guarantee contractually that something isn't going to get cut down for a thousand years? Like, I don't think anyone has any way to do that in terms of um, sort of political stability and so on. Um, so, uh, you know, as I, as I got deeper into it, I was like, oh, gosh, like, I'm not sure that we had any real carbon impact here at all. And so that kind of led me into the into the world of trying to figure out how do we remove carbon permanently with strong guarantees around additionality and low leakage and uh, and so on. Uh, now, um, there is uh, the Integrity Council for uh, Voluntary uh, Carbon Markets uh, that uh, was uh, released uh, in March. It looks like they're working their way towards some type of tighter framework uh, for um, uh, carbon removal uh, sector. But um, it's interesting on those uh, points, uh, Peter, maybe just uh, start about permanence and uh, just uh, kind of the problems around permanence. Yeah, I think the Integrity Council is like making very incremental progress in a place where I think to regain, regain trust, we probably need to make sort of revolutionary progress. Uh, you know, studies out of Berkeley and other places have shown that 90% you know, plus of the credits that are sold or bought are not really doing anything. And so like, we don't have like a, oh, we need to clean up a 10 or 20% problem here. We have like a, most of the market is garbage problem. And so like that requires something more than an incremental improvement. And the real issues at stake are things like leakage. So like, how do you ensure that while well, you may be reducing emissions in this area, that you're not just causing emissions to happen somewhere else? Um, and this can happen by like exporting manufacturing to another country where it's not as easily monitored, or you protect this set of forests, but it just moves logging uh, somewhere outside of that area that you protected. There's a lot of ways that leakage can happen. Uh, another place is additionality. So like the Nature Conservancy and the Audubon Society both got in very hot water because they were selling carbon credits for not cutting down a forest that, of course, they were going to protect anyways, because that's their mandate. So that's that's a failure of additionality. Like if they're going to protect the forest, there's no paying for the carbon offsets is not in any way sort of actually causing a difference in, in the behavior. It's not additional. And the last one is permanence, which is if you're going to sequester carbon away or, or offset it, it's got to be, it's got to stay out of the atmosphere forever because the stuff that you emitted by burning fossil fuels or that we all emit by burning fossil fuels goes, goes into the atmosphere forever as well. And so 
uh, most of these things, when you look at uh, natural solutions, most of them, unfortunately, are not that long term. And so you really have to work pretty hard to find ways to you know, store CO2 bound up chemically in rocks or uh, in CO2 injected into these very, very deep formations or our own process of bio oil sequestration where we inject bio oil into these very deep oil and gas formations where you can guarantee that it's going to be down there for tens of thousands or millions of years. Peter, I think that's a good setup. What does a charm industrial do? Yeah, so we use all different kinds of biomass residues. So things like corn stover or uh, waste wood, um, all kinds of any biomass waste that uh, we then cook into something called bio oil. And the way to think about this is we're sort of like a flash in the pan. Like when you flick water in the pan and it sort of goes up in a, in a poof of steam, that's effectively what we're doing with cellulose, uh, except then we condense that smoke uh, into bio oil. It is literally the same thing as liquid smoke and barbecue sauce. So when you eat barbecue sauce, you are eating bio oil, uh, or at least the aqueous part of it. And uh, we then take that liquid smoke and we inject it deep, deep underground into old oil and gas uh, reserves and salt caverns and, and things like that. Um, so yeah, that's our process. We're basically using the fact that CO2 is already being captured by these plants and then just doing a conversion and storage uh, into these very sort of much more permanent uh, places. And actually in the process of doing this, we also ended up putting char in the soil and improving the soil health. Um, so it has a bunch of good sort of ecosystem impacts um, as well. And, you know, to date we've delivered about 6,500 tons of uh, net CO2 removal. Uh, and if, you know, if we go and ask sort of the biggest buyers in the permanent removal space, you know, how much tonnage has been delivered to date across all permanent removal methods, it's probably about, they'll say less than 10,000 tons. So we're something like 65 to 90% of all permanent delivered, permanent removals delivered to date. Now, um, uh, help me out, Peter. So um, you're taking, uh, say, you're, you know, the farmer has harvested uh, the corn, for instance, but then you have the stalk and you have the leaves and everything that's left over. And then you'd be taking that, for instance, and then uh, converting that into the char, which is the eventual liquid. But what's the difference between that in terms of just actually letting that, you know, let it letting it sit on the field? Yeah, so if you let it sit on the field, a lot of the components of it are going to return to the soil. So things like the phosphorus, the potassium, some of the nitrogen. Um, you're going to have some of the carbon goes in, a very small percentage of that actually, like maybe 2 to 3%. Uh, and then you'll also have some protection from erosion and uh, both wind and rainfall um, and some things for the microbiome to chew on. And so the way that you can solve those things is first we leave some of the biomass actually on the field. And that prevents the erosion issues, leaves stuff for the microbiome to chew on. Uh, we put the char back in, which actually increases the carbon content relative to what it would have been and returns effectively all of the potassium and most of the phosphorus to the soil. Um, so you end up with actually a much healthier uh, soil setup. Um, so yeah, it's uh, we're basically extracting just a portion of the carbon and leaving behind a much more permanent carbon even, even in the soil than, than what was there before. But if the if the um, if the uh, corn stalk breaks down during the time, it's eventually going to release that uh, carbon into the air uh, right. during its uh, breakdown. As opposed to you, can't, okay, I've got it right now as well too. Yeah, so, within like two to three um, years, it would pretty much all be back in the atmosphere, minus a very small amount that's left in the soil. Okay, and then the advantage then also with uh, using uh, you're using a natural process that actually captures carbon and it, at the time goes naturally. So at that point, then you're just extracting and then putting it in. Uh, you were saying um, that um, uh, you know uh, you know the issue right now is uh, kind of really been uh, kind of the scaling up of this process. I guess I mean that's the thing that you hear about anybody that's uh, kind of getting into the molecule business. Yeah, that's right. And I think, uh, you know, the, the set of issues that you encounter are uh, both like operationally challenging and unexpected, you know, like you get a bottle cap in a pipe unexpected, like how did that happen? Uh, you know, you get, um, you know, phase separation that ends up solidifying and clogging things above ground, like all these like bizarre issues where like you don't kind of forecast the like fractal complexity of chemistry um, mm -hmm. until you like actually just try to operate it. And then you, you realize all the ins and outs of, of what you're dealing with. And so those are the operational things that we're that we're trying to work through. Peter, there seems to be no end of innovation in the carbon sequestration space. Uh, aren't you worried about a cheaper, better mousetrap out there? Um, I think there's actually going to be a very important role for almost all of the methods to play. So you have things like ocean alkalinity enhancement and enhanced weathering and, uh, you know, direct air capture and CO2 injection into underground mineralization into saline aquifers. 
and all of these things exist on a cost curve and but often the cheapest methods have more limited capacity so i think what we're going to find is that we're going to have to stack all of the methods in order to get up to 10 billion tons a year so if you look at like the ipcc reports around like how are we going to maintain one and a half degrees or two degrees celsius kind of long term they all require eventually ramping up to something like uh, 10 billion tons a year of removal and i think it's very unlikely that the most efficient way is to use something like purely direct air capture at scale because it's very energy intensive, very capex intensive. Um, that would require something like, you know, a hundred percent increase in total global steel production to build all those facilities. So it, that will be a director capture will be a very important component, but we're also, I think going to have a whole bunch of these other things, enhanced weathering being a great option, but more limited in capacity, uh, ocean alkalinity enhan enhancement, probably the same thing. Bio oil sequestration also going to be cheaper than direct air capture, but again, have some limits on capacity. So I think we're going to see all these things kind of chain together on a cost curve as we kind of go towards uh, 10 billion tons a year by you know, 2050 or so. Uh, the other risk uh, seems to be uh, politics. If you are buying carbon removal, you're doing this within some type of environmental, social governance uh, framework. But uh, this ESG has become highly politicized. Uh, you know, uh, the Republicans uh, beating up on BlackRock and uh, Larry Fink. You know, is there enough of a framework? Is there enough uh, solidity in this business uh, to uh, actually build a business out? Yeah, you know. I think ESG covers a lot more than uh, than carbon removal, and I think actually the carbon removal parts of things are actually like not very politically uh, charged at all. Like a lot of the support for carbon removal is is very both sides of the aisle in in, in DC. If you look at like a tax credit like forty five U, for example, um, like super bipartisan. So. Um, I, I know ESG has has like come under fire for a bunch of different reasons, but you know ESG is environmental, social, uh, social causes, and governance, and like it's, it's very broad. And in some ways, I think it's the broadness of it that has has uh, brought on a lot of the challengers uh, to it. Whereas I think you know cleaning up our trash, as it were, uh, and getting CO two out of the atmosphere, I think is uh, something that's actually become more of a bipartisan kind of agreed upon issue. And I think like the progress that we've made on 45Q uh, tax credit for carbon removal in the last few years is, is good evidence of that. Uh, now, uh, you talked uh, before uh, with your last company, uh, your disappointment when you were uh, getting some, uh, you know, when you were buying some carbon removal and then it turned out not to be what it is. Uh, the whole carbon removal space, um, I don't need to tell you, Peter, it, there's a bit of a gold rush. There's a lot of people that are going into it uh, because they see uh, the opportunity that's going to be out there. Um, I, I just wonder if, um, you know, we had a spoiled party uh, with uh, Bitcoin uh, in um, just uh, the last couple of years and how it's kind of come down as well to, uh, you know, is there going to be, a, is there a concern uh, that uh, when you were talking previously about, uh, you know, the stuff not really delivering what it actually promised, um, is it going to be, is that going to weigh on the industry if this uh, catches up to it? It's possible. I mean, I think I want to draw a really bright line between carbon offsets, which often don't even have anything to do with removing CO2 from the atmosphere and are often like, I'll pay you to stop emitting so that I can emit, which is like a totally different thing. Yeah, uh, I, I think, sorry, I'll stop there for a minute because I'm. I, 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 we should clarify terms here. So carbon offset versus carbon removal, Peter, uh, give me a hand. Yeah, so carbon offset is basically any time that you're sort of paying someone to go and stop doing emissions or... Um, uh, yeah, effectively reduce their emissions in some way so that you can go emit. And so you're not actually netting anything out of the atmosphere. You're basically just, it's a, it's a tool to try to drive reductions in emissions, but probably a very inefficient and uh, questionable one in some ways, um, because you're basically just paying to, to emit. Um, Removals, on the other hand, are where you say, hey, I'm emitting this, but I'm actually going to go pay someone to do an activity that actually physically removes that same amount of CO2 from the atmosphere and puts it underground. And that's a very different thing. Um, it's an additional activity. It's a permanent activity, et cetera. So these are subtly different, but they're, they're, it's important in, in, in what those differences are. And I, I do think it's pretty high likelihood that the world of carbon offsets goes away. I think we're seeing like a collapse in prices and collapse in capacity and, and, and so on. And like a lot of brand damage from people making bad purchases there. So as that declines, I think people will realize, okay, in order to get to net zero, I'm going to have to reduce my own emissions. And then I'm going to need to go buy removals for stuff that I can't reduce in my own emissions. And so actually carbon removal is like on a totally different, like upwards trajectory in the same way that offsets is in many ways kind of declining.
Gotcha. Uh, when you do a sale, who do you usually talk to at a company? Do you talk to the CTO, the CMO, um, you know, and also uh, when a company is buying removals from Charm, uh, what box are they ticking? I mean, how do they, you know, given your own example from uh, the last decade, I mean, how do they assess its value? Yeah, it's usually a, a like a C level or board level decision that a company should commit to a net zero uh, kind of pathway. And once they make a net zero commitment, which I think covers some extraordinarily large percentage of the economy now, uh, then the question is, how are they going to get there? And carbon removal is a key part of that. So usually then there's someone inside the company, like a task force or someone who's been uh, tasked with uh, like implementing that, figuring out how to get to net zero. And a big part of that is reductions. And then once they've got a path on reductions, then they kind of follow up with like, okay, well, you know, some of this stuff like flying around, like there is no sustainable aviation fuel option right now. So like, how are we going to deal with those emissions? And the way they deal with that is, is carbon removal credits. And so generally it's a, like a director of sustainability or director of environment or uh, director of climate, someone like that who has been tasked with figuring out how to implement a net zero commitment. Um, just to uh, finish off, Peter, um, you were giving a previous interview and then I liked how uh, you uh, found uh, generating char and then you were able to find a solution for that in terms of storing it within uh, old oil wells, which you were just mentioning before. And then after that, you've now found another piece in terms of actually helping with uh, steel production. What is that piece, uh, Peter? Yeah, and in some ways, this was our original ambition. So uh, we actually <laughs> wanted to use biomass to do iron ore reduction in iron making. Uh, but it turns out you can't transport biomass if economically very well to the you know to a big enough central facility. And so my co-founder Sean's big breakthrough was that we could convert the biomass first into bio oil, and then transport the bio oil, and you basically have like a six x denser, seven x denser kind of. Uh, that you can transport more easily. So that was the key breakthrough. We're very excited about it. We've made a ton of progress on uh, demonstrating the usage of bio oil um, via syn gas in, in iron ore reduction. And in the long run, we think actually most of our bio oil will go first towards reducing iron oxide to iron and then to, and then to uh, actually then taking that CO2 and pumping it underground. Uh, in addition, so we get both the reduction on the iron making side and then also uh, the carbon removal still off the back end. But if you're taking the bio oil and then you're using that for the uh, production of steel, aren't you uh, again ad admitting uh, CO2 or is it just that the process is um, how would well, you so say that process less we do get coal? CO2? Out of that yeah. process, we do get CO2, but it's a renewable loop. It's CO2 that came out of the atmosphere and we can take that CO2 and pump it into either saline aquifers or underground mineralization, in which case you still have the CO2 removal pathway. So we may actually get both fossil free iron making and a carbon removal pathway as co-products, which is something that we're very excited about. What's the uh, bigger opportunity? Is it the removal or is it uh, moving towards steel? Uh, they're similarly sized, probably both on the order of like a couple gigatons per year each. Peter. Thanks for speaking with Gecko. Thanks so much for having me. My name is Michael McRae, and you've been watching Kiko Mining. <laughs>